topic is adrenal gland uh, from the endocrinology. Okay, so, uh, I suppose everyone knows where adrenal gland is located. So, when we took a cross section of adrenal gland, adrenal gland consists of two parts. It has the outer part, which is known as cortex, and it do have an inner part, which is known as adrenal medulla. This outer cortex is further divided into two, uh, three parts, and each of these three parts create different kind of hormones. So it is important to understand this, like different layer of the adrenal gland and what respective hormones each layer is creating, uh, because you might get questions on this. And this is very easy. These are the easy marks. You can easily solve this as this and get some marks. So let's talk about the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona glomerulosa. As its name indicates, glomerulosa, that means it is it has something uh, related to glomerulus. And where is glomerulus located? It is located, it is a part of the nephron, or you can say kidney. So it secretes a hormone which affects on the kidneys. And what is the name of that hormone? Is the aldosterone. So now, uh, if any time, if you get a question like the, uh, which of the following hormone is treated by the zona glomerulosa, the answer is very simple. Glomerulosa means something which has to do with the kidneys. So the answer is aldosterone. Then the middle pa uh, part of the adrenal cortex, or you can say the intermediate part of the adrenal cortex is known as zona fasciculata. And this uh, this part uh, plays a very important role. It it creates a very important hormone, which is uh, which are glucocorticoids or cortisol, you can say. Then uh, the innermost layer of the adrenal cortex it is known as zona reticularis, which creates androgens. And this again, this is very important because androgens are very important uh, in terms of uh, male and female sexual uh, reproductive health. So androgens are very important. They have a big influence on the reproductive system. Then the inner part, which is adrenal medulla, it, uh, it secretes what catecholamines. So it, it has some different origin. Even uh, why it is secreting catecholamines, why it is not secreting a hormone which is uh, cholesterol-based, why? Why it is so different? Uh, because when we look at the embryological development of the adrenal gland, these two parts derive from different layers. So uh, that's why they have different origin. So they have different functions and they create different categories of hormones. Aldosterone, glucocorticoid, and androgens, all of these are cholesterol-based hormones, whereas catecholamines are different. So important catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine. So uh, let's uh, talk about adrenal medulla because uh, this is a very simple and it is not that ex uh, extensive as compared to adrenal cortex. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of a cholesterol molecule because uh, all the hormones uh, which are secreted by the adrenal cortex, they are cholesterol made. So it is important to understand the basic structure of cholesterol and you might get a picture of this uh, molecule and they may ask you what structure is it? Uh, what molecule is it? Or there are many questions they can ask you from the cholesterol molecule. So let's have a look uh, at this cholesterol molecule. The formula of cholesterol is C27, H46 and 1O. Uh, why C27 and why it is important to remember the carbon levels of the cholesterol molecule? Because uh, when we uh, look at the different uh, hormones which are made from cholesterol, they are different in the carbon numbers. So we can identify a hormone on the basis of carbon number. So again, the normal, a normal cholesterol molecule, which is not yet metabolized or processed, has 27 carbon atoms. And what else we can see in the cholesterol molecule? It has four rings, uh, A, B, C, and D. And uh, there are different questions. Like, uh, let me extract some questions from the cholesterol molecule. Uh, please do let me know in the chat box 
at which carbon level the hydroxyl group is attached. Look at the picture and solve this question. My question is, at which uh, carbon number the hydroxyl group is attached in a cholesterol molecule? Okay, uh, that's good. It is C3. My next question is, how many number of uh, rings are there in the cholesterol molecule? Yes, Dr. Melna, that's correct. Okay, why I'm uh, asking separately this question? Because maybe uh, you, may, uh, you may get a question in which they ask you, which of the following is not true uh, about the cholesterol molecule? So you, uh, in order to answer that, you have to cover a bit about cholesterol molecule. Or maybe they will ask you, which of the following uh, is uh, correct or which one of the following is not correct regarding the cholesterol molecule? So that's why this is very easy to remember. Again, yes, uh, four is the right answer. So what are the high yield points from the cholesterol molecule? Uh, it has 27 carbon atoms. The formula is C27H46O. Hydroxyl group is attached at the carbon number three. Uh, okay, I have another question. Uh, where is the hydrocarbon tail is attached for the cholesterol molecule? My question is, at which carbon uh, number the hydrocarbon tail is attached on a cholesterol molecule? Yes, C17 is the right answer. Okay, uh, this one is the hydrocarbon tail. And why did I ask this question? Because when the further hormones from the adrenal gland are gonna form from the cholesterol, this tail could be cleaved. So you should be know uh, from where this tail would be cleaved. Uh, it is at the carbon number 17. So what else uh, we are left with uh, from cholesterol molecule? Yes, we are left with one exceptional question. Okay, uh, uh, between which carbon number the double bond is present in a cholesterol molecule. Yes, uh, C5. Okay, my question is, between which uh, number of carbon atoms in a cholesterol molecule double bond is present? I'm asking about the double bond. Did you see any double bond at the carbon, uh, carbon number one? There is no double bond there. It's between five and six. Here you can see between the carbon number five and six double bond is present and that's the only double bond in the cholesterol molecule. So these are the high yield points from the cholesterol molecule. Again, why I put so much emphasis on cholesterol because this is very important for all the male and reproductive hormones. So we have a crystal clear understanding of the structure of this molecule. So let's move on to our next slide. So now you can understand the importance of uh, these carbon levels. Okay, your job is to remember which of the hormones are, 20, are consist of 21 carbon numbers and uh, which of the hormones have 19 carbons and which of the hormones have 18 carbons. So remember progesterone, deoxycorticosterone, aldosterone and cortisol. 
these are the adrenal hormones which have 21 carbon numbers in their structure. So these are 21 carbon steroids, you can see. 21 carbon steroids or 21 carbon hormones, they are progesterone, deoxycorticosterol, aldosterone, and cortisol. And here is another SPA. Progesterone is the precursor for others in the 21 carbon series. So progesterone is the first hormone in the steroidogenesis, uh, which comes from the cholesterol molecule and further give rise to other uh, cholesterol or adrenal hormones. So remember, if you in the exam, you will ask by this question that which of the following hormone is a precursor hormone? So the answer is progesterone. In a while, we will uh, talk about steroidogenesis, and uh, I will tell you like this progesterone comes from which, uh, which molecule. For now, remember 21 carbon steroid are progesterone, deoxycorticosterone, aldosterone, and cortisol. Then let's talk about the 19 carbon steroids. And now you can imagine how these 27 carbon numbers are, how they are processed and cleaved and converted into these hormones by the adrenal gland. And the process is known as steroidogenesis. Okay, then 19 carbon steroids are androgens and testosterone. Uh, uh, these androgens uh, are later on converted into testosterone uh, in the testis. Then uh, 18 carbon steroids are uh, is estrogen. So how do I remember this? Usually. Uh, boys are taller than girls so that's why testosterone have one more carbon number 19 and the girls are usually younger than boys so uh, or smaller than boys you can say so yeah, they have less number of carbon atoms which is 18 so 19 18 remember in sequence am i clear I uh, try to memorize these points here because all of these are SPAs and they are important and they are honestly if you remember here they are very easy and later on you just have to give a quick revision. So try to memorize with me at the moment and that's why I'm repeating all uh, these points again and again um, so that you it would retain in your mind. Okay so this is your steroidogenesis. Now you can see how that C27 uh, cholesterol molecule, uh, it is uh, when it is enters into the adrenal gland, how this is further processed. Uh, the process is known as steroidogenesis. And uh, why it is steroidogenesis? Uh, because it is giving rise to the hormones which are steroid based. So there is, uh, uh, don't try to memorize all, uh, all this process uh, of steroidogenesis, just uh, uh, just remember the high yield points. Let me tell you, if they ask you what is the first step or the first molecule which is formed in the steroidogenesis, that is pregnenolone. And now you can see how this pregnenolone gives rise to progesterone, which is 21 carbon uh, hormone. And this further gives rise to all of the rest of the hormones of the, which are steroid based in the adrenal gland. So remember these three points in the sequence. Uh, what they can ask you, uh, all the hormones, uh, or maybe they ask you particularly about estrogen, maybe progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, or aldosterone. All of them have the same precursor molecule, that is cholesterol. If that is not in the option, the precursor molecule will be pregnenolone. If pregnenolone is not in the options, then progesterone is a precursor molecule of all the hormones. So try to remember in the sequence, uh, because in the question, the options may vary. Uh, you may don't find the option of cholesterol there, then you have to choose that accordingly. So it is important to remember in the sequence, cholesterol molecule and pro from where that cholesterol molecule comes from. It may come from your, uh, from your diet. It may come from the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane, so whatever. Uh, we have the cholesterol in our body and it is important to have some good quality of cholesterol in our diet because now you can see how these uh, important hormones are going to form from the cholesterol. So remember cholesterol, it is further under the action of cholesterol desmolase, 
This is an enzyme uh, which is the first step in the steroidogenesis. Cholesterol desmolase converts the cholesterol into pregnenolone. Please remember the name of the enzyme as well. This is also high yield. And preg pregnenolone give, uh, is a precursor for progesterone. And progesterone is precursor for the rest of the hormones. Is everyone clear uh, till now? Uh, because I, I understand this is a bit tricky topic and I really don't want to mess with your heads. Okay, and please again, memorize with me. Okay, now we have progesterone. Okay, by under the action of 21 beta hydroxylase, and soon we will study uh, about the 21 beta hydroxylase, hydroxylase deficiency. So now uh, uh, let's study, understand that here as well. What is the function of 21 beta hydroxylase enzyme? It converts progesterone into, into 11 deoxycorticosterone, which further converted into corticosterone, which then forms the aldosterone. So you may skip these points. Just remember progesterone uh, is important. This 21 beta hydroxylase action is important if we want to have aldosterone in our body. So what happens in the patients who have 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency? So tell me, uh, is that aldosterone would be there or not? Please tell me uh, if 21 beta hydroxylase enzyme is deficient and it is not uh, able to process progesterone into further process. So does the body is able to make aldosterone? No, there would be no aldosterone then if there is no enzyme. So that means the process is not working fine. So there would be a deficiency of aldosterone. Yes. Similarly, if we look at this sequence, uh, this is the synthesis of cortisol hormone. Uh, and please tell me from which part of the adrenal gland cortisol comes from. Yes, fasciculata, we are, uh, actually we are studying biochemistry at the moment. Okay, so cortisol. Okay, we have another uh, metabolic disorder, which is autosomal, autosomal recessive. 11 beta deficiency, or we have 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, and we also have uh, alpha beta hydroxylase deficiency. So now tell me, if a patient have alpha beta hydroxylase deficiency, would that person have enough cortisol in their body? Okay, yes, there would be no cortisol. Similarly, if a person do not have 21 beta hydroxylase in their body, you can see here 21 beta hydroxylase is also playing a role. So if a patient is having 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency, does that patient have 11 cortisol, uh, have cortisol in their body? The answer is again, no. Even if a person have alpha beta hydroxylase deficiency, there would be no aldosterone. So in a nutshell, in the patients who have 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency, or 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, there would be less aldosterone or there would be uh, little or no cortisol as well. So what happens? If these are not, these precursors are not processing in this pathway, what happens in 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency or 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency? All these precursors would be shunted into androgen synthesis pathway. So, as a result, the patient, uh, the baby, or the newborn have excess amount of androgens, and that is the clinical finding. Uh, uh, we will discuss in a while what are the clinical presentations of a patient or the babies who are having 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency, or 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, or even 17 hydroxy, uh, 17 uh, 20 life deficiency, or 17 beta uh, hydroxy progesterone deficiency. So there are many autosomal recessive conditions. So uh, is everyone clear now or do I need to repeat anything? If you have no question, please don't. Okay, good, if it is it clear. 
so let's move on to the next topic uh, this is adrenal medulla now we are done with the adrenal cortex glomerulus are done we know how this hormone aldosterone uh, is being synthesized in the cortex uh, we are done with the zona fasciculata hormone which is cortisol now we are we know that how steroidogenesis uh, give rise to the cortisol level Uh, zona reticularis now we are know how androgens are being formed by the through the steroidogenesis now let's talk about the medulla if you look carefully at the medulla they have some different cells these are uh, you, you may say cuboidal cells and these cells are known as uh, chromaffin cells and why i'm putting emphasis on these chromaffin cells because some of the tumors may form here so have an idea so these are the chromaffin cells which secrete catecholamines that is epinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine uh, these uh, catecholamines are water soluble they are fast action uh, they derive from the tyrosine now compare both adrenal cortex hormones synthesized from cholesterol but adrenal medulla catecholamines derived from the tyrosine uh these chromaffin cells or adrenal medulla is innervated by preganglionic sympathetic fibers which acts to acetylcholine neurotransmitter so again uh these are uh, all the points i'm discussing right now uh, they are the question in the exam they are the high yield points so please try to remember if you in the exam you uh, they asked you which of the neurotransmitter is uh, present in the adrenal medulla or which of the neurotransmitter is responsible for the production of catecholamines in the adrenal medulla the answer is acetylcholine is everyone clear is everyone clear about the neurotransmitter which is acetylcholine it is responsible uh, what happens these sympathetic fibers treat this acetylcholine here in the adrenal medulla and as as a result the chromaffin cells produce epinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine and they are derivative of tyrosine uh, we have many pictures on steroidogenesis in the coming slides so don't worry okay uh, since uh, we have discussed uh, about the normal structure steroidogenesis and the different parts that the hormones of adrenal cortex and medulla now let's talk about some endocrinopathies so the important endocrinopathy from the adrenal medulla is uh, which is important for your exam is a pheochromocytoma it is an in- neuroendocrine tumor that grows from the cells called chromaffin cells so again uh, now imagine how these chromaffin cells are important uh they treat epinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine and they have the tendency uh they there is a chance they might get tumor which is a uh, neuroendocrine tumor and since they are producing catecholamines so what happens if any of the tumor occurs here the patient may increase uh, may release incre- may produce increased amount of epinephrine nor- norepinephrine or dopamine and those would be the clinical features of that patient so what are the clinical features uh, of the pheochromocytoma headache palpitations why palpitations because the patient have high catecholamines and we know uh, these catecholamines are released during uh, fight or flight response so uh, we all experience this if we saw a big line in front of us we got that palpitation so that is our neurotransmitters that are working at the moment marked by pounding flirting or beating rapidly hypertension yes because of the uh, because of again those catecholamines uh, pale appearance or you can simply imagine this is some over activity of your sympathetic system uh, sweating tremors or shaking investigations are uh, we go for the 24 uh, urinary phenyl mandelic acid or metanephrine or normethanephrine uh, these are the screening method uh and in order to look like the tumor we go for the ct abdomen management uh, okay in the exam they would not ask you about the management of your chromosome cytoma but i have added this for your information uh 
the definitive treatment is a surgery. And before we go for the surgery, we give the patient six weeks course of alpha blocker in order to control those uh, hyper overstimulated sympathetic sy symptoms. So another SBA, which is asked in the recall, they ask you about a pheochromocytoma is a part of which multiple endocrine neoplasias. So please look at this table and give me the answer. Pheochromocytoma is a part of which multiple endocrine neoplasia? One or two? Yes, two is the right answer. Pheochromocytoma uh, is a part of multiple endocrine neoplasia too. Uh, the rest of the tumors uh, or uh, the rest of the pathologies or neoplasias are primarily uh, hyperparathyroidism and medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. So uh, I have added both of them. You may have a read later on, uh, both about MEN1 and MEN2. Okay, now let's talk about the, we are done with the adrenal medulla and all the high yield points. Now let's talk about the adrenal cortex. So uh, this slide is a bit extensive. So uh, why, uh, how, uh, or what I suggest you do, whenever you are doing endocrinology, try to spend some time on this, this subject. Why? Because this is a high yield subject. There are many questions from the endocrinology and they are a bit tricky. So if you just uh, cram those SPAs, uh, you would not retain that for a long period of time. So I recommend that always, whenever you are studying some pathologies of any hormone, try to understand the normal function of that hormone. Why? If, why? Because if you understand the normal function of any hormone, you can easily pick out the pathologies. So uh, don't uh, memorize this. Uh, just have an, have an idea like how these hormones are being synthesized, uh, what are the axes of these hormones, and what are their normal functions. Once uh, we are done with that, then we will start the pathology. Okay, uh, any of you, uh, please still, uh, let me know. All of you are clear about positive and negative feedback mechanism. Do you have a clear understanding what is negative and what is positive feedback mechanism? Okay. Dr. Rebecca, okay. The, uh, okay, so negative and positive feedback mechanism. Uh, whenever you're uh, starting any subject, try to have a crystal clear understanding of the basic concepts because uh, these two words we uh, frequently use throughout the endocrinology. So let me give you a concept of uh, negative feedback first. So imagine you are hungry and you started eating something. Now your tummy is full. So what would be what would you do? Your uh, your mind your stomach sends a signal to the brain that I'm full. I don't need much food now. So what your mind do? Uh, it would send you the signal that please stop eating. So this is your negative feedback. Uh, let me portray this in the endocrinology. For instance, uh, if there are many negative feedback mechanism. Uh, for example, if we take insulin. Why we need insulin in the body when there is hyperglycemia, and uh, that hyperglycemia triggers the insulin release. Uh, similarly, your hunger triggers you to eat something. So once the insulin job is done, uh, it stabilizes the hyperglycemia. Now, uh, would uh, do you want to get hypoglycemic? Yes or no? Definitely no. You don't want to get hypoglycemic. Now the insulin job is done. So. At that very moment, this insulin, uh, through some mechanism, sends the signals to the hypothalamus that uh, my job is done. There is no need to produce more insulin in the body. So uh, the, and as a result, there would be no more insulin produced uh, by the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland or, uh, sorry, uh, from the pancreas. 
uh, from the pancreas. However, it is started all, all the way up from the hypothalamus. If we study the hypothalamic uh, pancreatic axis, uh, somehow just remember, uh, if we don't need any hormone more, uh, just uh, it, it is sent to the signals to the hypothalamus that no more hormone is needed. This is your negative feedback mechanism. Am I clear to everyone? Okay, so this is simple. Uh, again, just imagine if you if you are hungry, yes, you take food. When you are full, uh, your your stomach sends the signals to the brain that we I'm full, and your brain sends the signals back, stop eating. So this is your negative feedback. Uh, this is not the stomach and eating example is the neg negative feedback. Basically, it is all about the endocrinology and the hormones regulation. So all of the hormones in the body, they are mainly controlled by the negative feedback mechanism. Uh, the positive feedback, what example should I give you? Okay, if we, uh, all the girls should agree with me. Uh, we girls are by nature, we are like that. The love is never enough for us. The more we get the love, the more we want the love. So same goes with the positive feedback mechanism. For example, uh, it is seen in the process of, uh, during the menstrual cycle. There is a high level of estrogen, and that, uh, once that uh, high estrogen level is achieved, it sends more signals to the hypothalamus that I need more estrogen. And uh, that estrogen that leads to further for uh, in order to go for the ovulation. So this is your feedback, a positive feedback, which is mostly seen uh, during the menstrual cycle by the estrogen. Am I clear? Okay, so remember these concepts throughout your endocrinology. You are studying any uh, any hormone regulation. Please do consider this positive and negative feedback mechanism. Now let's start uh, our adrenal cortex hormone. So let's talk about glucocorticoid secretion. Uh, I'm only going to discuss the high yield points. Uh, it follows a circadian rhythm. By that means, uh, cortisol levels are highest just before waking up around 8 a.m. in the morning and lowest in the evening during the midnight uh, around 12 uh, a.m. So just remember, cortisol levels are highest uh, before waking and lowest in the evening. That's it. Now let's talk about the hypothalamic control of corticotropin releasing hormone. Again, start from the hypothalamus. It secretes corticotropic releasing hormone, uh, which acts on the uh, pituitary gland to secrete uh, anterior pituitary to secrete an uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And this ACTH is responsible because it acts on the adrenal cortex to produce further hormones. So uh, what, uh, what is the axis? Hypothalamus secretes corticotropic releasing hormone, which acts on the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone. Let's move on. Uh, let's talk about the negative feedback control of cortisol. Cortisol inhibits the secretion of cortical releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and the secretion of uh, adrenocortical hormone uh, from the anterior pituitary. So again, now, uh, yes, that but, uh, when, uh, when the body needs cortisol, yes, it is being produced by the hypothalamus corticotropic releasing hormone, ACTH, that ACTH acts on the adrenal gland, uh, particularly on the adrenal uh, cortical fasciculata, street cortisol. But once there, there's enough cortisol in the body, this cortisol sends the negative feedback uh, to inhibit the secretion of uh, corticotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. If that is inhibited, automatically there would be no more ACTH and automatically there would be no more cortisol. So this is your negative feedback mechanism. Uh, and here lies the, uh, the uh, patho pathology, you may say, or the mechanism behind the DEXA methasone expression test. It is based on the ability of a dexamethasone, a synthetic glucocorticoid or cortisol, you may say, to inhibit ACTH secretion. In normal person, low dexamethasone inhibits or suppresses ACTH excretion uh, if, we, if that follows a normal negative feedback mechanism. Uh, consequently, cortisol excretion. In person with ACTH tum uh, secreting tumors, low dose dexamethasone does not inhibit cortisol excretion, but high dose dexamethasone does. 
in person with adrenal cortical tumors neither low or high dose rexamethasone inhibits cortisol secretion so uh, for now just read this slide and later on when you uh, you are revising this topic please try to memorize these findings and try to understand how uh, what is the mechanism of rexamethasone expression test so uh, apparently or in a nutshell uh, in normal people if we give the dexamethasone expression if we do that it normally follows the negative feedback control of the cortisol or the glucocorticoid but in uh, if the person has some pathology that would not follow this normal negative feedback cortisol so uh, what are the actions of cortisol uh, we are talking about the glucocorticoid which comes from the adrenal fasciculata it stimulates gluconeogenesis okay now imagine cortisol is your stress hormone so whenever we all experience stress in our life so now imagine when we are in stress what type of things our body need at that time so what those things which we our body needs at that time it is provided by the cortisol so uh, these are the functions of the cortisol so what it do it stimulates gluconeogenesis that means it increases the glucose level because during stress uh, we need glucose and we used to take ice cream when we are facing any stress so we need glucose that means so it is provided by the cortisol by the process of gluconeogenesis it also decreases glucose utilization and insulin sensitivity of adipose tissue it increases lipolysis which provides more glycerol to the liver for gluconeogenesis it also have anti inflammatory effects prostaglandins and leukotrienes are involved in the inflammatory process response glucocorticoids have anti inflammatory properties uh, by inhibiting the formation of precursor uh, arachidonate no need to remember much details uh just remember the normal uh, high yield points the no normal function of the uh, glucocorticoid hormone okay for now we know we need glucose during stress anti inflammatory effects it is evident uh, from the fact that we use corticosteroids for the many inflammatory conditions and we also use corticosteroids in the autoimmune uh, conditions when we want to suppress the immune system so that means it has a normal function of suppression of the immune response then uh the next function is maintenance of vascular responsiveness to the catecholamines so it up regulates the receptors on rtdols and increases their sensitivity to the vasoconstrictor effect of the norepinephrine thus with excess cortisol the blood pressure may be high so we are done with the normal function of the cortisol now let's talk about the aldosterone and we are well familiar with this hormone so basically it is not that an, a much control under the acth it is mainly under the influence of regulated by renin and eutensin system uh, and by potassium so mainly uh, if you get a question in the exam they may ask you what is the main regulator of the aldosterone hormone so what would be your answer please tell me what uh, what is the main uh, or the stimulator you can say or the regulator of the aldosterone hormone uh it is regulated by renin angiotensin system but mainly the most potent stimulator for the aldosterone secretion or regulation is potassium yes if you don't if you find that option ras is correct but uh, as far as i remember i have seen some recalls uh, there is a one recall which is frequently repeated in which there was no option of renin but they do have the option of potassium along with calcium no sodium and other molecules so remember potassium is the most potent regulator of aldosterone secretion okay so there are another there are many high yield points from endocrinology is very important i must say all of these questions are your spa so they uh, they ask question from the renin and eutensin aldosterone system and these are some high yield points they may ask you about the renin what is renin it is an enzyme uh, catalyze the conversion of angiotensinogen to angio angiotensin 1 so 
please memorize this whole line or this whole slide if possible. Uh, for instance, uh, they may ask you, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1 under the action of which of the following? So the answer is renin. Or in the other way around, they may ask you, renin is responsible for which of the following? Conversion of angiotensin 2 into angio, uh, angiotensin 3 maybe, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, or maybe they give you some other options as well. So answer is and renin is responsible for the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Then now angiotensin 1 is, has been formed. Now what, uh, how this would be processed further? This one is now converted into angiotensin 2 under the action of this enzyme. And they may ask you where is this process is taking place. Please tell me where does in the body angiotensin 1 is being converted into angiotensin 2 under the action of ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. Yes, perfect. Lung is the right answer. And where, uh, from which structure the renin comes from? Yes. Kidney is the right answer. Yes, juxta glomerular apparatus more precisely. Yes. Okay, so what would be the next step? Now we have angiotensin 2. Okay. Angiotensin 2 acts on the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex to increase the conversion of corticosterone to aldosterone. Aldosterone increases, uh, now it is now acting on the kidneys, on the collecting tubules, on the distal convoluted tubules. It increases sodium absorption, thereby restoring extracellular fluid uh, volume and the blood volume to the normal. So do you know when this renin angiotensin aldosterone system would get activated? And what, uh, why the nature has designed this system? What is the purpose of renin angiotensin aldosterone system in the body? And why these uh, enzymes and uh, molecules are being messed around? What is the purpose of having a system in our body? Yes, to maintain blood volume, but, uh, but at what particular conditions it gets stimulated? Yes, correct, decrease, decrease blood pressure. You can take the example of hemorrhage. In case of hemorrhage, this would be, or maybe in, during the very low blood volume, but uh, just take the example of hemorrhage so that you would remember. When BP, when there is low blood pressure, Yes, okay, let's move on. Hyperkalemia increases aldosterone secretion because we know uh, uh, potassium is the most potent stimulator of aldosterone. So yes, if there is more and more potassium in the body, there would be more and more aldosterone. So that makes sense. Okay, actions of aldosterone. Uh, Remember carefully, if you remember these three points, you can solve any uh, colleges related to this, uh, can, uh, this part of the adrenal gland. So what are the normal functions of aldosterone? It increases so, uh, sodium reabsorption. Uh, it increases potassium secretion. It increases renal hydrogen ion secretion. I'm repeating this again. Now imagine aldosterone uh, increases renal sodium reabsorption. That means if it uh, reabsorbs sodium, the more water would be absorbed in the, uh, in the body. So just imagine a person is going through hemorrhage and the body is trying to hold the body fluid back. And, and uh, once the RAS system is get activated, yet aldosterone, aldosterone is being produced and what is its section to retain body's volume and how it would do that. It would reabsorb the sodium more and more and along with sodium, we know that water follows. So if we have, if we, if this aldosterone retains sodium, it would retain water and it would help to increase the blood volume. One function done. Then uh, everything, everything has a price. 
if the body is retaining sodium they uh, the body has to pay something this aldosterone if aldosterone is become sodium more and more uh, it has to do uh, it has to give back something and what is giving back uh, the aldosterone is giving uh, giving up on the potassium so it increases the renal secretion of potassium in exchange of sodium so everyone is selfish even at the uh, hormonal level everything is selfish we have to uh, this is all about give and take so increased renal hydrogen ion secretion so along with potassium this hydrogen would also be secreted now let's talk about the pathologies now if you have crystal clear understanding of the normal functions just if uh, just reverse the, uh, those normal functions and you will you are you are done with the diagnosis of this pathology so let's talk about primary adrenocortical insufficiency which is your addison disease now if in the addison disease we know they, there is no adrenocortical hormone so uh, what would happen the normal function of these hormones would be reduced so uh, now uh, now decrease all the normal functions or reverse all the normal functions so it is mostly caused by autoimmune destruction of the adrenal cortex the most common cause if they ask in the exam is the autoimmune disorder it is characterized by decrease adrenal glucocorticoid decrease androgen decrease mineral mineralocorticoid uh since these hormones are decreased so ats acth would in return increase because now the pituitary and hypothalamus are trying to attempt to compensate that loss so that's why acth is increased hypoglycemia because uh, we know the normal function uh, was to increase uh, glucose level but now there is no cortisol so there would be no uh, no process, no further formation of glucose so hypoglycemia weight loss hyperpigmentation due to increase acth level uh, decrease pubic index lady here hyperkalemia hypertension hyperkalemia why hyperkalemia because aldosterone is no more working it is no more secreting potassium uh, so as a result it is accumulated in the body hyponatremia because it is not getting reabsorbed by the adrenal uh, by the aldosterone so that's why we are losing sodium so it would lead to hyponatremia metabolic acidosis uh, due to uh, due to this hyperkalemia uh, it would lead to uh, hydrogen ion retention which leads to metabolic acidosis then we have eosinophilia and lymphocytosis as well so what is secondary adrenocortical insufficiency which uh, occurs when the pituitary gland is not able to make enough hormone acth and how we can differentiate primary from the secondary Uh, in secondary there would be no acth and if there is no acth there would be no hyperpigmentation so this is the classic difference in primary adrenocortical insufficiency there is increased acth because the body is trying to increase that loss of hormones so there would be uh, hyperpigmentation but in secondary adrenocortical insufficiency the problem the problem is within the pituitary gland so there would be no acth Uh, yes there are all the findings uh, of the adrenocortical insufficiency but there would be no hyperpigmentation is everyone clear about uh, the addison disease or if you have any questions you may ask me or if you are getting bored please do let me know i will precise the uh, lecture as well Okay, no questions. Okay, good. Because uh, I was wondering, I'm just teaching and teaching, and nobody is giving any response. I thought uh, everyone is sleeping. Okay, so now let's move on to the Cushing syndrome. Now imagine, in Addison disease. there there were no normal ad, aldosterone hormone or cortisol hormone but in cushing disease there is an excess of cortisol hormone so now we know the function of uh, cortisol we need cortisol during stress and in stress we eat ice cream so we need glucose so what the glucose uh, the cortisol would do it increases the gluconeogenesis through various means then uh, we know that uh, when we treat the patients uh, 
who are having some immune disorders, we uh, give corticosteroid to suppress the immune system. That means that is a function of uh, cortisol. Uh, another important function is it has anti-inflammatory effect because we give corticosteroid during uh, during treatment of many infectious diseases. So these are all the normal functions. So what happened in the Cushing syndrome? We know there is an excess. So all these functions, the normal functions would be amplified. Okay, so what happens when this uh, cortisol androgen levels are raised? Yes, if they are raised, they would be decreased ACTH because now the body uh, body thinks that, uh, yes, we need that more hormones, so there is nothing to do at the moment. Uh, it's same goes uh, here if you kept on eating, 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 and you didn't tell your mind that I'm full, uh, you will keep on eating. So sim similar cases here. Uh, the, uh, like there are a lot of cortisol androgen levels, but there is no suppression. Uh, so ultimately, there would be uh, decreased ACTH level because of the persistent increased level of these cortisols and androgen levels. Uh, hyperglycemia, because the normal function is increased glucose, so hyperglycemia, it is exaggerated. Increased protein catabolism and muscle wasting, why? because this hyperglycemia, uh, the normally cortisol use gluconeogenesis and it utilizes different resources like protein and everything. So that's why if there is more and more glucose from gluconeogenesis, there would be protein catabolism. And once there is protein catabolism, there would be muscle wasting. Central obesity, because of the fat redistribution, poor wound healing, viralization of women caused by elevated levels of androgen as well, hypertension, osteoporosis, elevated cortisol levels cause increased bone desorption and striase on the tummy. Ketoconazole, an inhibitor of steroid hormone synthesis can be used to treat Cushing disease. So here you can see all the clinical features a person might have who have Cushing syndrome. There could be emotional disturbance in large why emotional disturbance? Because we need cortisol uh, uh, to, in order to regulate our emotion, emotions or the stress as well. So it may affect our emotional uh, mood. Uh, it do have some mood effects. Okay, but important, moon phases, osteoporosis, cardiac hypertrophy due to hypertension, buffalo hump, obesity, which is mostly pronounced on the lower part or the central part of the tummy. Why? It is because of the fat redistribution. Uh, there could be adrenal tumor hyperplasia, which could be the underlying cause. Abdominal stria, amenorrhea, muscle weakness, purpura, amenorrhea, why? Because of the disturbed androgen levels, purpura, and skin ulcers. So these are some of the clinical features of the Cushing syndrome. Now let's compare what is Cushing disease and what is Cushing syndrome. If Okay, I won't recommend you to memorize all these slides. I, has, uh, I have just made them so that you would know the normal functions. So once you know the normal functions, uh, solving this Cushing syndrome or Addison disease would uh, become a lot easier. So your task is to remember these points, this table. Uh, Cushing disease and Cushing syndrome. What is Cushing disease? It is mainly a disease which is ACTH dependent characterized by increased level of ACTH in the blood and mainly caused by pituitary adenoma. Why pituitary? What, uh, why, uh, what is the pathophysiology behind that? This pituitary adenoma, we know whenever there is a cancer, there is a risk of increased production of particular hormone, which is produced by that organ. So in case of pituitary adenoma, what happens, there would be more and more ACTH level production. And once there is ACTH, increased level of ACTH in the blood, uh, so we termed it as ACTH dependent, and it is always endogenous. But when we look at the Cushing syndrome, it is it does not depend on the ACTH level. It is classically characterized by increased level of cortisol rather than increased level of ACTH. Why? Because it does not depend on ACTH. Why it does not depend on the ACTH because the cause uh, uh, lying behind the pathology in the adrenal gland itself, maybe adrenal adenoma, 
bilateral adrenal hypertrophy, adrenal carcinoma, and steroid treatment. It may be endogenous and may be exogenous. So in the exam, you may ask this question, what is the most common exogenous cause of Cushing syndrome? So what would be your answer? What is the most common cause of Cushing syndrome? Uh, what uh, exogenous cause of Cushing syndrome? Yes. Steroid treatment or exogenous steroid. Yes, pharmacological steroid use. Yes. Okay. What is the most common cause of Cushing disease? Okay, uh, this is a point I want to make uh, make that clear. Yes, pituitary adenoma is the correct answer because endogenous cause uh, is always uh, if if in the question they ask about you Cushing disease, if you had uh, listened to me carefully and same mistakes you do in the exam, so always make sure are they asking about the disease or the syndrome and then go and choose your answer. If they ask you about the pushing disease, that means it is something which is related to pituitary gland rather than the rest of the pathologies. So if they ask you about the Cushing syndrome, then the answer is exogenous steroid treatment. Then let's now, uh, so far we have done with Edison disease, which was uh, adrenocortical deficiency or insufficiency. Uh, then we talk about the pushing disease, which, which is the excess. And now let's talk about hyperaldosteronism, which is also known as Cohn syndrome. And now imagine all the normal functions of the aldosterone hormone. And now you can easily conclude that what would be the finding in the Cohn syndrome, because now all the normal functions of the aldosterone are being exaggerated. So this is how you can understand endocrinology in a better way. So it is caused by aldosterone screeching tumor. It may lead to hypertension because we know uh, uh, the normal function of the aldosterone, it comes and play its role when there is hypertension in the body. Because uh, why hypertension? Because they, if there is more and more aldosterone, there would be more increase in the sodium absorption. Uh, which leads to increasing the extracellular fluid volume and blood and which leads to hypertension. So th this is very simple. Hypokalemia, because yes, if there is more and more sodium absorption, in return, the aldosterone have to pay the price and that price is potassium. It is losing potassium, so leads to hypokalemia. Then uh, if it loses potassium, along with potassium, the hydrogen ions would also be uh, being secreted uh, and the loss of hydrogen ion means there is alkalosis. So it would lead to metabolic alkalosis and decreased renin secretion because there is no more stimulation for the renin because we know renin and your tensin system, and your tensin system comes in uh, and play the role when there is hypertension in the body. And in this particular case, there is always hypertension. So there would be decreased renin secretion. So I think now everything makes sense to you. Okay, your job from this presentation is to memorize at least these tables. These are your SPAs. It would cover all of your Edison, Cushing, and Cohn's in a nutshell. So what is Edison? If you quickly want to revise this, these three together. Edison is chronic primary adrenal insufficiency. That means there is no adrenal hormones. Cortisol and aldosterone deficiency. If there is no this cortisol and this aldosterone, the normal functions of cortisol and aldosterone would be loose. Patient may have hypertension, hyponatremia, hypokalemia. Tests are 9 a.m. cortisol and synchathin test. In Cushing disease, there is excess of these hormones. So the clinical findings are reversed. You can compare both. Here we have hypertension, here we have hypertension, weight gain, and diabetes. Then the test for Cushing disease is dexamethasone suppression test, and we know that the mechanism behind dexamethasone suppression test, uh, we are classically assessing the negative feedback control of ACTH and the hormones, or 24-hour urine decortisol. Then if we look at the cones, say aldosterone excess, so the normal function of aldosterone has been exaggerated, 
which leads to hypertension and hyperkalemia. Hypertension, why? Due to sodium retention. Hypokalemia, why? Because aldosterone is paying the price of that sodium, which is your potassium, so leads to hyperkalemia, along with your um, metabolic alkalosis. But uh, here you can see there is hyperkalemia, so they, so imagine along with potassium is the hydrogen ion, so it may lead to metabolic acidosis. What are the tests? Yes, we know that aldosterone is a part of renal aldosterone uh, system, so we assess the ratio. We do the saline suppression test, or we can do fludrocortisone uh, suppression test as well. So these, uh, this is a table you have to memorize. Now let's talk about 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. Now, if you imagine we are moving from outwards in the adrenal cortex to the inwards, and for now we have discussed the endocrinopathies from the um, zona glomerulosa and zona fasciculata. Now we are at zona reticularis. And we know that zona reticularis is responsible for androgen synthesis. So now we are discussing the pathologies of androgen synthesis. So the most common cause of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Uh, okay, it's, uh, the uh, what was the question? Let me remember. Uh, there was an SPA in which they asked about directly about I think the most common cause of uh, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia maybe. So the answer is 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. And what is the second most common cause is the is your 11 beta hydroxylase. Yes, second most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the alpha beta hydroxylase deficiency. So remember both of them. Most common is 21 alpha and second most common is 11 beta. And we have discussed that how these are being, uh, what is the pathophysiology behind that? If we don't have 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, we, I, yes, I have that steroidogenesis. If there is uh, what we have, let me see where is that. Yes, here we have 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. Here we don't have this enzyme. What would happen? There would be no aldosterone. Here also 21 hydroxylase enzyme plays a role. If that is not there, there would be no cortisol. So what happens, all of these precursors would be shunted into androgen pathway. And as a result, there would be increased, very increased level of these androgens, andro, steroidinidione, and testosterone. So this is all about 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So the baby may present with ambiguous genitalia. Why? Because there are excessive androgens, which may lead to clitromegaly. Uh, females may present with urogenital sinus due to high levels of cir circulating androgen adrenal androgens. So they're going to need to remember all of these. If you have time, you can do it if you want to have a better understanding of this uh, disorder. However, just remember 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency is the most common cause of um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And what are the clinical findings? The baby may have ambiguous genitalia. And what, recess, what pattern it follows? It is autosomal, autosomal recessive disorder. Okay. It may, okay, we know if there are more and more androgens, they may lead to virilization. Uh, and here you can see how she's a uh, girl which have excessive hair, uh, excessive pubic hair. And same goes if there's a boy. Uh, he's also having excessive pubic hair. So now let's talk about alpha beta hydroxylase deficiency. Yes, if there are no alpha beta hydroxylase, there would be no cortisol. Again, there would be uh, less aldosterone. However, aldosterone level may be normal because it is also controlled by 21 hydroxylase. However, uh, again, here, all these precursors are shunted towards sex hormone synthesis and the person or the baby may have more androgens. And uh, this would lead to infertility. Okay, now let's talk a bit about ambiguous genitalia in the sequence. Since we are discussing that, so we'll have a look on this topic. Uh, okay, or when we suspect ambiguous genitalia, what is the definition of ambiguous genitalia? So the answer is when the external genitalia do not appear completely male or completely female, we termed it as ambiguous genitalia. 
then uh, when to suspect these are criteria when micro penis is there like, uh, that means if the stretched penile length is less than 2.5 cm in a term newborn that means the pa uh, that, that baby have ambiguous genitalia uh, or there may be asymmetry of labiosacral folds there may be penis with bilateral non palpable testes there may be unilateral cryptorchidism with hypospadiasis. So all of these are pointing towards ambiguous genitalia. Here you can see, uh, this is a picture of micropenis and the uh, stretch penile length is less than 2.5 centimeters. So this is ambiguous genitalia of a baby who has 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency. So uh, this is a table you may remember uh, in, in cases of uh, baby boy who have genetic makeup of 46 xy genotype they uh, the conditions which may lead to ambiguous genitalia is partial androgen insensitivity there may be complete androgen insensitivity uh, there may be five alpha reductase deficiency or gonadal dysgenesis so these are the conditions which lead to ambiguous genitalia in a male baby or uh, or a baby who have genotype xy uh, when we look at the fem uh, 46 excess, uh, in, in the females, uh, this ambiguous genitalia may lead to virilization, but in males, it lead to undermasculinization. That means undermasculinization means they don't look like a male. And virilization means uh, development of male-like structures like increased bone, muscle strength, and uh, virilization or the pubic hair, etc. So the cause in the 46 excess genotype of ambiguous genitalia is again 21 hydroxylase deficiency. We have discussed that in uterus for you to maternal androgens will lead to ambiguous genitalia and gonadal dysgenesis. Then there are there is another category of ambiguous genitalia which is over testicular disorders basically that may uh, be seen in true uh, hermaphroditism. Uh, in what happens there, both testicular and ovarian tissues are present in the gonads. So it is true hermaphroditism that the baby may have both testicular and ovarian tissue and it may lead to ambiguous genitalia. Uh, is everyone clear up till now or do I need to repeat anything? Okay, good. So this, I think this is the last slide. This is about evaluation of ambiguous genitalia and these are, uh, this is a high yield slide. Uh, basically all of these slides are high yield. There are many questions of endocrinology are covering from this presentation. So uh, let's have a look how we can um, manage or investigate uh, of a patient or a baby who have ambiguous genitalia. Now imagine uh, you are working in um, an orphan gynae and you deliver a baby and the nurse came to you and asked you the baby's uh, genitalia are not yet cleared. So now you apply, uh, you assess the baby, you know the criteria now that what is the criteria to categorize a baby uh, with the ambiguous genitalia. So what would be your next step? Uh, you will check the karyotype for sure. If that is 46XX, that means she's uh, genotypically female. Uh, then what questions would we come to your mind? Like uh, if she's a female, then she's, she she's supposed to have uterus. If there is no uterus, that means it is something related to malaria and agenesis. If the uterus is present, that means it is not malaria agenesis. Now and we need to rule out some other things. Uh, for example, the, we know that the most common cause is 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. So start the workup for that. So 17 hydroxyprogesterone is the marker we use to uh, diagnose the patient uh, of 21 uh, alpha hydroxylase deficiency. And this is your SPA. Like if you want to uh, you, you want to find out, does this baby with ambiguous genitalia have 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency? You need to measure this level of 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Is everyone clear? Please remember 17 hydroxyprogesterone is the marker which we use to diagnose a baby with ambiguous genitalia to, uh, to diagnose that uh, she is having 
21 hydroxylase deficiency. Is everyone clear? This is high yield. And I know this topic is pretty confusing, so that's why I'm putting so much emphasis on this. 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Okay, some, some students may think if a baby has 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, so we need to measure that in order to find in order to diagnose the patient. But but that's not the case here. If we want to diagnose or we want to rule out 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, we need to check 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels. So what would be your next step? Now you have ordered this investigation. It may come back normal. It may come back increased. So what happens if it came back increased that confirms your diagnosis of congenital adrenal hyperplasia? This topic is done. If that came back normal, then you need to find out further things because uh, you already ruled out malaria genesis. So what would be your next step? You may do ultrasound, ovarian testicular ultrasound. You may order the biopsy to find out other pathologies. Uh, there may be true hermaphroditism. That means the baby may have bisexual gonads, which is also a cause of ambiguous genitalia. Then in other case, you may assess maternal virilization. That means there is a chance, uh, since she's a female baby, there is a chance she has been exposed to the maternal androgens during pregnancy. So you, you need to assess that as well. And for that, you need to assess the maternal virilization disorder, like how much levels of androgens a mother has, which affected the baby. So this covers all about ambiguous genitalia. So this, uh, these are just a demo question. However, I have discussed all the high yield SPAs from the recalls uh, during the session. So take this as your test. Uh, regarding cortisol, which of the following is true? You have uh, 45 seconds to answer this question. Okay, I got only one answer. Yes, B is the right answer. Well then, yes, B is the right answer. Plasma concentration increasing pregnancy with estrogen does not it does not cross placenta in significant amounts. Plasma concentration is peak in the morning. Uh, these are some of the high yield points from the cortical. Okay, your next question is which of the following disorder is correctly matched to an appropriate diagnostic test? Please be quick. You have only 45 seconds out of which 20 seconds are, has already been passed. Okay, your correct answer is P. Cons, in cons, we do slime expression test. What is cons again? It is the abnormality of aldosterone excess. Clinical features are hypertension, that hyperkalemia. Why? Due to increased sodium retention and increased potassium excretion. And the tests are renin aldosterone ratio, saline expression test, or crudro cortisol expression test. So, thank you so much for bearing with me so far. If you have any questions, you may ask me, or otherwise, I would end the session.
Welcome, Dr. Melna. I hope now endocrinology made more sense to you. Uh, yes, Dr. Ramya, we can do a session on embryology. Uh, yes, definitely. Sure. Okay, for those students who were asking about, uh, I have seen some messages, they were asking about some exam-oriented material and the SPA. Uh, yes, the, uh, the good news here, we are currently running over one of the course, which is our Power Hour course, in which we are discussing all the high yield topics along with the SPA practice. And uh, we are, uh, soon we are going to arrange a workshop on which, uh, which is a 15 days workshop in which we are going to discuss all the important uh, last five years past recalls in those 15 days. And yes, definitely, uh, while discussing those SPAs from the past recalls, we will address all the relevant high yield information along with that. And trust me, that's a trigger start to your preparation. It would help to summarize and uh, your all the MRCD1 curriculum and uh, before the exam, uh, you will feel more confident if you cover all the high yield topics along with the SP practice from the last five years recalls. If any of the students have inquiry regarding our workshop, which we are going to arrange in coming days, and uh, if you have any queries regarding our currently running courses, you may ask, uh, you may contact our coordination team. Or if you have any queries, you can, you are more, we are more than happy to help you.